And that reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, page 974, if you're using the Bibles on the seats. Matthew chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Matthew 10, verse 1 to 15. This can be found on page 974 of the Red Church Bibles. Matthew 10, beginning to re read at verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah, and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you are indeed um, great. You are an awesome um, God, having the name above uh, every uh, name. As we come to you now as your children, um, who won your name, that family name, and we pray that you, Father, will speak to us through your word, and that we might delight in you and that you'll instruct our hearts and minds so that we can live um, for you in the time that you've given us here on earth. Amen. Please do um, be seated and do turn to Matthew, um, page 974. Let's look at these verses together. So this um, past week, um, I've had this um, post that keeps um, reappearing in my um, Facebook um, feed. Um, it um, reads, um, quote, I put together a free webinar called How Our Church Grew from 20 to Over 400 in Only Two Years. Uh, in this webinar, I will share what we learned on our journey of growth, including... The three secrets of church of growing churches, the two biggest barriers to church growth, the number one thing you need to focus on right now if you want your church to grow. I'll unpack the exact strategy and tactics we use to grow from a church of 20 to over 400 in only two years. 
Can't wait to see you in the uh, webinar. Here's the link to save your seat. So here's the question. Should I reserve my seat? What do you think? He's um, giving me the... Well, no. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> there are many books that have been written, many conferences held dealing with the topic of church growth and evangelism. But I want to share with you the best thing that I've ever read um, on the subject. And thankfully we had it read because it's Matthew 9, 35 to <clears throat> 10, 15. See, what should matter to us, what is vitally important to us, is what Jesus um, has to say on these um, topics. That's what we'll explore uh, as we look at these verses and see how Jesus set in motion a plan to take his church from 12 disciples in Israel to 2.4 billion Christians throughout the world. Now, that's church growth. So we have to ask the question. Here's the fundamental question. When I saw that keep popping up, and isn't it interesting that it came up this week uh, as I was preparing these verses, what would Jesus' strategy be for reaching people in Hull in 2019? How would Jesus grow um, St. John's? What would his priorities be? What principles would guide and govern his ministry? These must be our um, primary questions that set the course of our lives personally and direct the ministry of this church um, corporately. So I think there are four principles through these verses that we'll work through. Here's principle number one. Preach the word. That is our number one um, conviction Jesus travels to different towns and villages with the express purpose of teaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. So when Jesus went to a new village or a new town, where would you find him? Where did he make a beeline for? The synagogue. Why? Because at the synagogue, he could always get a hearing for his teaching. People were there, ready for the scriptures to be read and to be taught. Jesus' ministry is one of um, proclaiming the word of God concerning the kingdom of God. And so that's his number one conviction. He has this twofold ministry of teaching and proclaiming. Jesus taught the word. We see that, don't we, all the time in the gospel, he takes time to educate people on the truth of God's word, carefully taking them through various scriptures, interacting with people, answering their questions, asking a few questions of his own in order to bring about greater understanding. He put before the people careful, reasoned, compelling arguments about himself and about the kingdom. He taught, 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 taught. But Jesus also proclaimed the word. And we do need to see a distinction between these words. Because in, in proclaiming the word, he stated the truth forthright, clearly, in an unapologetic way. Proclaimed is more like the business of the town um, crier with important news, breaking news that needs to be heard, must um, be heard. Uh, this word proclaim that's used here encompasses the idea of urgency, passion, um, appeal, it must be heard, has a right to be heard, because this is breaking news. He taught the word and proclaimed the word. If we're going to fulfill the mission, our mission as a church, then the truth of God's word must be taught and proclaimed by us. One of our core values here at St. John's is the authority of the word. The Bible is the pillar defining who we are, determining all that we do. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. We're committed to preaching, teaching, counseling, evangelizing, living by the sufficiency of the whole counsel of God as given to us in the Bible. Because as the Bible declares, it contains everything that we need for life and godliness. One of the things that I have in my head as I think of life is this. God's Word is written in ink, 
All my plans and all the plans of this church are only ever in pencil. God's word has absolute authority. Sola scriptura, scripture alone. You see, we've been given a task by Jesus, and our first tool for this task of growing the church, proclaiming the kingdom, is teaching, teaching and proclaiming the word of God. Brothers and sisters, if we lose confidence in the word of God, to do the work of God, that is to build the church, then whatever it is that we build through whatever the means we choose, it will not stand the test. It will not stand the test. See, as tempting as it may be to go for the latest fad, the latest gimmick I'm out there, the latest cultural trend, As tempting as it may be to think to ourselves, well, if I'm just a decent person around other people, then that will bring them to Christ and they all become Christians. Well, Jesus says, no. Not only have you not truly loved them, you have not done anything that could save them. Principle one, we must teach the word. That's our number one conviction. Please wrestle with these questions tonight and this week that I'm going to ask you now. Some of them are on the sheet that you can take home. Do you truly believe in the authority of God's Word? Do you truly believe that God's Word is powerful and effective? Do you submit to its authority? Do you point people to its teaching? Do you boldly declare that teaching as breaking news that has a right and must be heard. See, if our church is to grow, each one of us have to sow. Sow in the Word of God through teaching and proclaiming. Let me move on to uh, principle uh, number two. Provide for the wounded. Compassion. Conviction, teach, proclaim the Word of God. Compassion for the hurting. It all starts with seeing. Look at verse 36. Jesus sees something that uh, evokes his compassion. And this word compassion that's used, um, it talks about a deep um, seated um, movement down in the bowel. What we might say that we felt it in our gut. It was deep um, down there. Jesus was deeply moved by what he witnessed um, around him. But what is it that he witnessed? Well, we're told that the people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, verse 36. The people were vulnerable. They didn't have a shepherd to lead them into good pastures so that they could be nourished. They didn't have a shepherd to protect them against the wild beasts that would seek to devour them. So he looked out and he saw people and he just thought, look at the pitiful, precarious position that they find themselves in. And he was filled with compassion. Jesus has a real heart for people. And his heart for people is uh, address, addresses their situation in two ways. The first I've already spoken of, he taught them. But don't miss that. In response to his compassion, the first thing he does is he teaches them. But second, the second way he addresses their situation and shows compassion is by relieving their suffering. The text says that he healed um, all their um, diseases and illness. So Jesus' ministry was founded on his teaching, but it extended out into meeting the real needs of the people around him, hurting people. Um, Ted um, Roosevelt, the 26th um, President of the United States, said this, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now he's on to something, isn't he? We need to see people through the lens of compassion, just like Jesus did. Let me ask you to Think over your life and ask yourself, do you love the helpless, 
Do you love helpless and harassed uh, people? Because Matthew says, well, here's the proof that the king's um, here. The king has come. The sick are healed. Demons are cast out. And then Jesus says, go in my name to help hurting people and heal the sick and cast out demons. So the disciples went and they said, you know that the king has arrived and we're here with the message of the king and here's how you know because the sick are healed and demons are cast out. And then Jesus says, go in my name to help them. And in saying these words, Jesus established the mission for the church that has lasted now for over 2,000 years. Do you know that wherever the gospel has gone, when you read church history, burdens have been lifted? Who built the hospitals? Who rescued the drunkards off the streets of Seoul in South Korea? Who built the orphanages in Africa? Who fought for the rights of the lowest in society? Who built the schools? Who educated people who weren't supposed to be educated? Who cared for the widows? Who cared for the dying? Do you know who did it? Jesus' people. Wherever they took the gospel, they relieved the suffering of the hurting. Christians did all these things because our master sent us out into a world that was hurting to heal the sick. Let me tell you something. The world is still full of wounded people. The world is still full of hurting people. And we may not be filled with the miraculous power that Jesus gave to his apostles, but we can still be filled with the compassion of Jesus Christ and the apostles to reach out to the hurting with whatever Jesus has put at our disposal in order to alleviate their suffering. And so the Lord needs to open our eyes so that we can see the helpless, see the harassed, and filled with compassion, stretch out a helping hand. Principle three, pray for workers, dependence on God, a conviction to teach the word, um, filled with compassion for the hurting, and then a dependence on God. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful. In other words, there's no lack for what God wants to achieve through his people. The lack is for workers. The workers are few. So what's the remedy for this shortage of uh, workers that Jesus identifies? Well, Jesus' words uh, were countercultural then as much as they are now. He doesn't call for the workers to put in longer hours or be more productive with their time. It doesn't even tell them to go on a recruitment drive to build up the core team. All of those may have been useful, but Jesus doesn't mention any of them. Now, the church's primary response to the plentiful harvest can be summed up in one word, pray. We're to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. We plead and we pray and he earnestly asks the Lord of heaven to stir up his people to be workers in his field. And within this is an implicit warning for us to be aware of the tendency to be busy at so many other things and neglect the effective deployment strategy of praying to the Lord of the harvest. That's why, you see, when you read a passage like this, the next time you hear an encouragement to be at the prayer meetings, to be focused when we're praying together in services, this is where it comes from. This is why corporate prayer at St. John's is so vital to our mission. We're asking the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. That's what we do, don't we? At central meetings, what are we doing? We're praying for the workers. Praying for the workers and praying for more workers. Listen to this sober warning from a, a Bible scholar. He said this, quote, A creeping death 
sweeps over the mission of many churches in our time. Because quite simply, prayer meetings have ceased. And beneath the death of prayer, at a deeper level, lies the death of real belief. Prayerlessness, whether in my life or in this church, is always a declaration of independence from God. <laughs> Independency from God. So principle three, we're to pray. And then what do we request of the Lord? To send out and work us into the field. Uh, the Greek word for send out is uh, ek balo. Uh, the ek part means out, and balo means to either throw, cast, drive, propel. That's um, what the um, word means. It comes into um, English as the word ballistic, relating to the science of the motion of um, projectiles in flight. So we're praying, <laughs> what we're asking God is that he will set in motion the launching of his people out into the harvest field of the world. We need to pray that God would propel people out of the church. That's often what the last prayer is about, isn't it? At the end of the service, Lord, cast us out into schools. Cast us out into the factories, propel us out uh, into universities, into the um, office. Lord, throw us out into homes, into neighborhoods, into your harvest field. Lord, throw some of us out into foreign lands where there are no workers. Ek balo us out. Each one of us are to be cast out, propelled out into the harvest field, full of compassion with the word of God. What does Jesus want from our ministry? Principle four, plan with wisdom, discernment. We're all part of um, this work. Nobody can make an excuse. No one can say, oh, I'm too ordinary. Do you know why? Jesus chose 12 ordinary men. They didn't come from Jerusalem. They weren't the sorts of uh, men who held high office or had um, lots of money. What did these men know? Most of them, they knew hard work, long hours. And combine that with then wisdom from God. You've got what you need for the task. Often we don't feel up to the task in front of us. When God ek us out, we worry that we're not strong enough, wise enough, gifted enough. We see what's ahead of us and we say, but Lord, I can't do it. It's too much for me. I have too much I'm on. My life is overwhelming. How can I contribute um, to the harvest? When the Lord says, yeah, it is too much for you, but it's not too much for me. Ordinary people, an extraordinary God, and the harvest can be brought in. Jesus wants to prepare his disciples for the whole spectrum of responses they will face. Jesus says, look, when you enter the towns and the village, or for us, when you enter the factory, the office, the classroom, the home, you can't predict in advance who will welcome or who will reject um, the message. You've just got to be ready for whatever happens. Sometimes, when you're talking to somebody and sharing the good news, it'll feel like you've got your feet under the table and that they welcome you immediately. And Jesus says, good. Keep going. <laughs> Make the most of that. But other times, their response of rejection will be so outright that rather than getting your feet under the table, all that's left is to dust off your feet and walk away as a testimony against them. Do you know why Jesus gives this bit? Imagine if we had to be full of compassion with the word of God, but not discerning. What would you end up with? Christians forever being taken for a ride, wasting their time, wasting the opportunities because they don't apply wisdom 
to the mission. Now we need to be discerning as individuals and as a church where we put our energy, where we put our resources. And it takes time and wisdom and much prayer before you shake the dust of your feet and move on. It's not something you rush into. You shouldn't do it simply because a few people won't listen or you get a few small setbacks. But we also have to remember that Jesus says we're not obligated to stick with people forever. If people have hardened themselves to the message, reject the message, Jesus says it's wise and discerning to move on. There may come a time when you've done all that you can and you're free to move on and proclaim and teach the word to others. So let me finish let me close. Do you know, I'll take your advice. I don't think I'll book my place on the seminar, the webinar. Instead, I think you and I should continue to go forth with the truth of God's Word, having the conviction to teach it and proclaim it, and that we should move out in compassion, ready to meet the needs of those we minister to, the helpless, the harassed, and to take each step prayerfully, knowing that we're fully reliant on God because it's His harvest field, His mission, and we're just workers. And we're to plan with wisdom, wisdom that comes from God, so that we don't waste time, we don't waste opportunities in this short life that He has given us to be His workers. This is the Lord's strategy for how we will build His church in whole in 2019, in 2029, 2039, 3019, however long before he returns. This, brothers and sisters, is what we have to commit ourselves to as we seek to grow his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, I pray a simple prayer, but with all the weight of what's just been spoken. That as you send us out, as you ballow us from here this evening, we'll go forth with these four principles on our minds and in our hearts, ready to live them out in the week, months, and years ahead to your praise and glory. Amen.